Hi Steve fans and welcome back. For me, when I head off on a dive trip, I want to get as much in water time as possible. And there's no better way to maximise your bottom time than going on a liverboard. I'm a massive fan of liverboards and in this video I'll be giving you a comprehensive overview of everything I can think of that is liverboard related. For those here for the first time, my name's Mark, I'm the Editor-in-Chief of the Scuba Diver Media Brand. And welcome to the Scuba Diver YouTube channel. Take two seconds, hit that subscribe button, and then you won't miss out on any of our future videos. And ring that bell so you get notification of the latest releases. Want some free stuff? Everyone loves free, right? Check out the description below for all sorts of goodies, like a free digital subscription to any of our magazines. Where we can, we'll link you to the destinations or equipment that we talk about in the support our channel section in the description below. For transparency, we'll earn a small commission each time you purchase after clicking on one of these links, and this will go directly back into making more content for you to enjoy. Now, let's dive into the video. Liverboard. The name kind of gives it away. The dive boats, which you live on board. Now back in the day, when liverboards first came on the scene, they were, to put it bluntly, decidedly rough and ready. And keen divers were happy to endure grotty cabins, shared toilets and other dodgy elements in order to hit some of the best, most inaccessible diving on the planet. How things have changed. The remote dive sites are just as awesome as they ever were, but now many liverboards more closely resemble luxury yachts, with air conditioning, ensuite cabins, hot tubs, you name it. Let's just say you're no longer roughing it when you are back on a liverboard adventure in this day and age. Okay, so let's kick things off with selecting a liverboard in the first place. As I mentioned in a previous video, where you really benefit from a liverboard is when you use it to access out of the way places that cannot be reached by day boats. Yes, if you're diving somewhere like the Cayman Islands, where most of the dive sites can be day boat dived, when you're on a liverboard, you can rack up four or even five dives a day. But for me, the beauty of a liverboard is being away from the madding crowds and heading out on the high seas. How long is your vacation time and how much budget have you got to play with? These two things will narrow down your options and help you select your final destination. We can all longingly dream of heading off to Cocos Island, but if we haven't got several thousand dollars to hand and a couple of weeks being able to take off work, it's just a pipe dream. So be realistic, give yourself achievable parameters that you can work in. Depending on where you live, there are plenty of liverboards out there running week-long itineraries around some amazing dive destinations, from throughout the Caribbean, in the Red Sea, across the Indian Ocean, and around Southeast Asia. If you have 10 days or longer at your disposal, then you can look at extended itineraries in these locations, as well as other destinations which require more time in order to actually reach the dive sites in the first place. Be aware that the cost will increase the more remote the destination. Finally, safety. Accidents involving liverboards are, thankfully, few and far between. But after some much publicised incidents in recent years, safety on a liverboard is even more of a top priority. And so you will find that companies are even more safety conscious than ever before. However, for peace of mind, you can ask about what safety features and procedures are in place on your chosen boat when you are booking. But more about that later. Booking your liverboard trip. There are various ways of going about this. You can book direct with the boat or parent company, for instance, Aggressor Adventures, and then sort out your own flights. Or you can go through a dive specialist tour operator like Paddy Travel and book the complete package in one place. There are pros and cons to both methods. Some people like to trawl around for keenly priced flights and so on, and building the trip is part of the excitement for them in the first place while others are happy to just let someone else do all the legwork. Some of the package deals also include dive insurance, an absolute must in this day and age, so it's worth considering all of these factors when making the decision whether to go it alone 
or work with a dive travel specialist. So you've narrowed down your choices, you've selected your liverboard and you've booked your trip and now you're getting ready to go. The first thing to remember is that you're going to be living on a boat for a week or longer so you can leave all those fancy clothes you bring to go out to dinner on an evening at home. Casual is the name of the game on a liverboard, which is another reason I enjoy them so much. Shorts, t-shirts, maybe a lightweight fleece for an evening if the temperature drops a little. That's it. I've got my liverboard clothing list down to a T now and rarely come back with something that has not been worn. Get creative. I plan to put on a clean t-shirt after showering from a day's diving and I can then wear that same t-shirt the next day in between dives. It's also worth bearing in mind that storage on boats is limited, so if you rock up with monster dive bags, you're not going to be too popular. Consider bags which can flatten down somewhat once you've emptied them, so that it's easier for the crew to put in the hull. If you are going to require rental dive equipment, sort that out with the boat beforehand. You do not want to turn up for your trip to find out that they do not have your size available. If you bring in your own gear, I'd advise you to get it serviced before you go, if it hasn't been done for a while. There's nothing worse than setting off on that dream liverboard trip of a lifetime and find that your regulator is free flowing or your BCD inflator is not working. Many liverboards require divers to carry a reel or spool and a delayed surface marker boy. As you'll know if you've watched some of our previous videos, I consider these essential pieces of dive kit that all divers should have. However, if you're not familiar with them, get them before you go and get some practice in so that you know how to deploy a DSMB from depth. Again, this is not something you want to be doing for the first time actually on your trip. Do you get seasick? If you don't have good sea legs, then it's better to be prepared than feel like death warmed over suffering on board. Being prone to seasickness doesn't necessarily exclude you from liverboard diving, but come armed with the appropriate medication to tackle it head on. Just make sure that any seasickness tablets are okay to dive on, and if you need them, start to take them before you step on board. It's completely pointless trying to tackle the issue when you're already feeling as rough as a bag of spanners. It's probably also worth you limiting your choice of liverboard to those in calmer locations that don't involve long ocean crossings, because that will finish you off. When you arrive on your liverboard, you will generally be greeted by the crew, often with a cold, damp cloth to mop your warm brow and an ice cold drink. You do feel a bit like some VIP boarding a private yacht. Your bags will depo be deposited on the dive deck and they'll allocate your area on the dive deck. Every diver has their spot on the dive deck for the entire trip. This not only helps you know where you are going each day, but it also helps the crew keep track of who is still out diving and who's back on the boat. Your BCD and regulator will remain on your cylinder for the duration of the trip. Your wetsuit will go on a hanger and your mast, fins and other accessories will go in a box under your seat. Cylinders are filled on station, so all you need to do on your return from a dive is turn off your gas, purge your regs and undo the first stage from the pillar valve. If you're not nitrox certified, consider doing your course before your trip. Many liverboards offer nitrox fills for free, so it seems a shame to miss out on this bonus. Nitrox has many benefits, especially with repetitive dives such as on a liverboard. Check out our nitrox video for the full skinny. The crew will generally allocate cabins and then usher you into the salon for a boat briefing. This will go over all the facilities on board and run through how to set up the air conditioning in your cabin, what not to flush down the marine toilets and so on and so forth. Some discussion about the plans for the week in terms of diving, route etc usually takes place now too, so that you get an idea of what sort of schedule you can expect. There's generally a separate dive briefing to go through the procedures for diving, be that from the main vessel or from a rib or a dive tender, and this usually follows the main boat briefing. Now you may have been on a gazillion liverboards, but make sure you pay attention during these briefings. One, it's only polite, and two, there may be elements that are different to your previous trips. Don't be that person who comes and asks a query that was answered in the briefing, 
because you were not listening. There will also be a safety briefing to run through what to do in case of emergencies. This will involve explaining where life jackets and life rafts are located. You will have to demonstrate putting on a life jacket. Um, they'll show you where the emergency exits and hatches are. And advise you to make yourself familiar with their operation as well. Don't just assume that you'll know how to do it. And so on and so forth. Check out that they have a night watching operation and find out where the charging station is for batteries. As I've said before, there are very few incidents involving liverboards when you consider how many are operating around the world at any one time. But it's better to play safe than sorry and be prepared yourself. Liverboards are all about maximising your dive time and so you can expect there to be anywhere from three to five dives a day depending on where you are in the world. This will normally be three or four dives during the day followed by a night dive. You'll find it a rather hectic schedule to start with. It really is a case of dive, relax, dive, eat, dive, chill out, dive, eat some more, dive and then sleep and then repeat. But don't feel that you have to do every single dive on offer even if your buddy or the rest of your group want to. You're on holiday so do as much diving or as little as you want. I've been on liverboards where people did the two morning dives, had a little siesta in the afternoon and then did the night dive. I personally am not a huge fan of night dives unless you're on a wreck or something equally exciting so I tend to do all of the day dives and then relax with a beer on an evening while ploughing through the photographs I took during the day. That said there's nothing worse than sitting out a dive and then kicking yourself when the others return with tales of mating mantas, dancing dolphins and wondrous whale sharks. Many liverboards these days have paddle boards and kayaks available for your surface interval or when you want to skip a dive and do something else. If the itinerary is one of those that remains close to land, such as in the Bahamas for instance, then the crew often schedule beachcombing excursions in the dive tender. Trips in locations like this can also work if you've got any non-divers in your party. Now liverboards are generally not ideal for non-divers, but if you're on a trip which offers all that I've mentioned, then they'd have enough to keep themselves occupied while you went diving. You'll undoubtedly be well fed while you're on a liverboard. I'm constantly astounded at the variety and sheer amount of food that appears from the galleys on these things. Don't expect to go back losing a few pounds, especially if the boat has a pastry chef. Oh my god, a warm donut with a coffee when you come back from a late afternoon dive is simply heaven. Some liverboards include alcoholic beverages. Others charge extra for beers, wine and spirits. But regardless, just be aware that you're banging in a lot of dives over a relatively short period of time. Don't go overboard with the drinks, otherwise you're risking missing out on dive days if the crew believe that you're still under the influence. While on the subject of drinks, let's talk water. Most liverboards are in tropical locations, so as well as the dehydration caused by the dive in itself, you're going to be losing liquids from the sun and the heat. Make sure that you drink plenty of water during the day. I generally have a bottle of water with me at all times when I'm topside, and then I keep refilling it as I drink it. I aim to drink at least 7 to 8 litres of water when I'm somewhere really hot, such as Egypt in midsummer. Staying hydrated is one of the best ways to try and avoid any potential issues, so get that water down your neck. Generally, you do one or two dives on your final day on board, so that you can leave 24 hours before your flight home the following day. This has numerous advantages. You can give your dive kit a good rinse and then lay it out on the sun deck to dry it out. Usually it will be bone dry by the time you come to pack up your bags at the end of the day. Just remember to secure anything lightweight so it doesn't fly overboard. Drape your wetsuits over the railings but not the zipper cord around a stanchion. Likewise your BCD, just clip it through the railings. This enforced downtime also lets you relax and chill out on what is effectively a big private yacht. Soak up those final rays of the sun, enjoy an adult beverage in the daytime safe in the knowledge that you're not diving again and wrap up your trip in style. Some boats require you to dine off the vessel on the final night once you're back in dock. So if you were going to save a tiny little bit of luggage space for that fancy Hawaiian shirt or cocktail dress, keep it for this final evening. 
Tipping is commonplace on liverboard, but as to how much depends on where you are in the world. In Egypt, for instance, $100 is considered a good tip for a week, whereas in the Caribbean, it's often touted as being 15% of the cost of the trip itself. So that's a far higher amount. Trips to remote locations such as Galapagos, Malpelo and Cocos can see pretty hefty tips. So it's worth factoring that in when you're budgeting for your next liverboard adventure. Check with your potential vessels what the expected tip will be when you are researching these destinations. Let's wrap up this guide to liverboard diving with dispelling a few myths that I often hear whenever liverboards crop up in a conversation about diving. Liverboards are expensive. At first glance, I can understand some of these concerns. However, once you factor in that the cost includes your diving, accommodation and food, and as I mentioned, in some cases, alcoholic beverages, suddenly that price becomes a lot more reasonable. So when you're planning a trip, look at the whole picture. If it's between a land-based vacation and a liverboard, tot up all of the costs involved and then make an informed decision. You'll often find the liverboard is actually more cost effective. I'm not experienced enough. Liverboards are not just for experienced divers. Now don't get me wrong, there are certain locations and itineraries that are flagged up as being only for experienced divers due to the conditions that would be common and commonly encountered in the water. But the vast majority of liverboards out there are suitable for all levels of diver. In fact, I strongly believe that going on a liverboard as a fledgling diver is one of the best things you can do. Where else would you be able to rack up 20 plus dives in a single week? I've seen open water divers with a handful of dives come on in leaps and bounds over the course of a week on a liverboard. By the end of the trip, their buoyancy was much improved, their rate of air consumption had dramatically reduced, and we'd taken pounds of lead off their weight belt. Being immersed, excuse the pun, in a diving environment for a week or two is a fantastic learning experience. What if I don't get on with everybody? You are going to be out at sea with your fellow passengers and crew for seven days or longer. It's inevitable that, that you, you know, there's gonna be some people on board, you're just not gonna gel with them for whatever reason. But hey, that's life. I've been on literally hundreds of liverboards and by and large, I've seen very few instances where people have really, really not got on. Just remember, you are all there for the same reason, to do some fantastic diving, and you all have diving in common. So keep conversations away from polarizing topics, religion, politics, and you should be fine. Most liverboards are big enough that you can always find somewhere quiet to just chill out on your own. You're not all crammed together in one tiny space 24 seven. What do you like most about liverboards? Leave your comments below, and if you've got a question, fire away. Because if we can't answer, maybe someone in our growing community will be able to. Remember, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out our playlist for more inspirational and educational content. As always, stay safe. And if you're going diving soon, maybe on a liverboard, enjoy.